This is this is our fourth and last video. And what it's about, it's about political decay. So we have Fukuyama's model for political order. And now what we're going to do is look at political how what he defines as being political decay. And he basically has six types of political decay. And we'll go through each one of those separately. Important reminder is that the top in the fifth in the political order model that the top three dimensions there affect the political decay. Whereas the po political decay itself, the bottom three are affected by the political decay. So uh, the, the bottom three are basically the process issues. So the processes are affected by all of these different decay items, whereas the top three are, which are really a, a forces, they really affect those a political decay. First one is clientelism, and basically this one really is about the politicians themselves. He talked about a legalized gift exchange in which politicians respond to organized interest groups that are collectively unrepresentative of the public as a whole. An example would be if, if, if you know, if it were to, to happen that, say, Hal Burton were to offer a, 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 the, a vice president a CEO position once he or she were to leave their position, they would know that that was going to be open to them. It's a legal gift exchange, but it also would, would the idea is that it would make the vice president a uh, more uh, open to things that Hal Burton wanted to see, which is certainly not representative of the public as a whole. In other words, mass distribution of individual benefits by politicians to supporters. This example would be if they were to offer, say, to a, a whole religious group that they would take intelligent design and push it through to all of the schools in order to get their votes. So this is where the politicians themselves are the ones who are who are really a uh, kind of spearheading the decay, if you will. The other issue, the biggest issue, is that that the other challenge is that the people who are we expect to fix this problem uh, are basically the politicians themselves. So we're kind of asking the fox to keep his or her eye on the hen house, which is which is really kind of a uh, a, a non-event. So that's something that 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 is is provides a great deal of challenge to the whole process. Neo patrimonialism is another one of the decay items, and and it's basically this one's more focused on the leaders themselves. All right, so the leaders pay lip service to the distinction between public and private interest, but rule for private gain. So these aren't the politicians, but these are the leaders. This is where Marcus. Putin and, and, and Salman are, are, are basically examples of, of leaders who are basically autocrats and they're pretending to be Democrats. Another example is elites prevent free competition in both the political and economic system. So the system gets weighed down where private schools, inheritance, better health care, better legal representation, different prisons, better cars and goods all sit on one side of the scale. And a, yes, therefore, the elites, you know, are getting all of these and the system is supporting them. And so it's basically it's oligarchs pretending to be Democrats. So neo-patrimonialism is about the leaders. It's about the autocrats and the oligarchs pretending to be Democrats. Re-patrimonialism is, is about the citizens. And this is where the citizens are willing to settle for privilege over universal rights. So they're willing to take the, the First Amendment Bill of Rights and they're willing to overlook some of the uh, guarantees of the Bill of Rights in order to get some kind of special privilege for themselves. Other is the capture of the government by well-organized interest groups that are collectively unrepresentative of the public as a whole. And we talked about this earlier, but a uh, broad consensus is one of uh, Fukuyama's main points, is that we have to have a broad consensus. And if the, when you have a well-organized interest group, it's not really collectively, it's collectively unrepresented of the public as a whole. You're not really getting a broad consensus. Vitocracy, or vetoocracy, I actually don't know how he says this, but anyway, it's it, basically a special interest use the legal system to stop action. And this is where in our constitution, our constitution basically states that, that people can petition the government for redress of grievances. And so what's happening is these special interest groups are using this, this, a, uh, uh, piece of the Constitution in order to constantly 
try and, and, and redress grievances, which is constantly try and get into the way of, of, the, uh, of the government getting the job done. Individual veto players can block action by the whole polity. This is a, the lobbyists in, in the past when they first started lobbying, in the, or at least when it started to be popular in the 1970s, the lobbyists were using mostly a defensive plan. But now they basically have built an offensive plan. They now understand the whole process of how policy is built, and they're busy adding veto issues inside of the whole process from the from the beginning of, of what policies we're going to design all the way to the execution of the policies and and the uh, and getting in there trying to uh, uh, stop somebody from for the, the the state bureaucracy from getting the job done so veto power is really you know it's a it's a very destructive force against the whole concept of capacity that we talked about. So when when a, uh, when Fukuyama talks about capacity, this veto power is really allowing an awful lot of people to get in and and a uh, and upset the what makes the, uh, the team, the environment, and the process work right. Institutional rigidity. All right, this is where there's a series of rules that, that lead to outcomes that are commonly acknowledged to be bad yet are regarded as essentially unreformable. Examples of this are the Electoral College, the Senate rules, the primary system, system of campaign financing, gerrymandering, and bill riders. I mean, these are areas where, a, uh, where, the, the, where Fukuyama points out that the, you know, that the rigidity of those things, and, and basically he also then talks about Congressional mandates that collectively produce a sprawling government that nevertheless fails to perform many basic functions and does others poorly. This is this is institutional rigidity, which is another example of a um, uh, of political decay. The main challenge here is that many Americans consider the Constitution and Declaration of Independence quasi-religious documents. So it's really going to be hard to change some of those things. Now, presidentialism, which is the last of the decay, is where people wish for a powerful authority that will cut through the blather of politicians and actually make things work. And we have a number of historical characters who who, uh, who have come across that people are are that people are hoping that they will cut through the blather of the politicians and actually make things work. And it, but it's really it's 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 anti-democratic. And so basically where we are now is we looked at Fukuyama's political order model, his six dimensions of political order. We've looked at his six concepts of political decay. And so basically we have covered all of the things that are in his, uh, uh, in his book, at least from the perspective that, that we want to get to in his book, Political Order and Political Decay. So we're finished. Thank you.